be a gateway, which is very different than for Bitcoin. Although it's hard to be a Bitcoin miner, you don't have to get the approval of the other Bitcoin miners to be a Bitcoin miner. Anybody can be a Bitcoin miner. Not everybody can be a Ripple gateway. Um, so that just, from a decentralized point of view, I'm like, how is this decentralized if I effectively have to trust the gateway? And this is sort of debatable. Um, but then what actually happened was, after, you know, we, we haven't officially decided anything. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Stellar is still an option. But so Stellar is a fork of Ripple. They did use or did use the same protocol. Stellar actually did have a fork. It was like the worst case scenario that we thought was possible actually happened with Stellar. Um, so they had a, a, a consensus, you know, fork because they don't have a blockchain, so I don't know what you call it, but it's, you know, the two halves of the network went off on a different ledger. And there's no way to reconcile this, because with Bitcoin, you can always look at the longest blockchain. There's a mathematical way to know which one is correct. It's the longer one. With Stellar, there's no way to know. You have to trust Stellar Incorporated, which, which or not incorporated, it's like a nonprofit or whatever. But, so it's, it's less decentralized. It's, there's, if there's a spectrum of being decentralized, being centralized, um, Stellar is pretty close to the decentralized side, but not as close to Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is probably as decentralized as it is. Yeah, uh, I heard Stellar is like writing the entire protocol. Yes, they, in, in their blog post, uh, they said, <laughs> they are, there's a, somebody at, at Stanford that they're talking with uh, who's creating a new consensus protocol for them. Well, this is like a very fundamental thing for them to be changing their consensus protocol. And I, I, I've met people at, at Stellar, I think they're great human beings, uh, but I, I don't think their protocol is correct, and this is obviously why they're changing the protocol. I don't know if we're going to get it correct the second time, maybe they will, uh, but as far as I'm aware, there is, you know, they actually, they're, in their blog post, they said there is something fundamentally wrong with this protocol, which is the same protocol that Ripple still uses. So Ripple has never had the fork that Stellar has, uh, but they're subject to exactly the same issue, which is if, if two halves of the network go off for long enough on a different, you know, ledger, then all of a sudden they're just permanently forked with no way to reconcile. Um, so, yeah. so help me understand this use case. So, um, if Reddit chose not to spend 10% of that money for their user base, right? Like you, you want to give out X amounts back to in a monetary value, right? So you're giving money back. If you chose that it was some other reward or some other value, I don't know, some access to a certain part of Reddit which is only accessible to these people, right? So there's no monetary uh, funds being transferred. How does 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 that mean you still use the Bitcoin blockchain, or then do you think okay, some of these off the shelf other like whatever we, I don't even understand the word like other another blockchain makes more sense, kind of like what Q Chain's doing or something where there is no Bitcoin underlying the asset transfer. Right? Uh, yeah, so we I guess you're just like depending on what our application is, yeah. it, it might not be appropriate to put it on the Bitcoin blockchain, and these are this is still an open possibility. Yeah, we are leaning heavily towards either colored coins or side chains, but we haven't committed. And we may yet do something different. Um, and uh, depending on, it really depends on things like, like legally. Like, uh, let, me, let me give you a, a, a fantasy version of how I would like to, this to play out. I would like it to be the case that the SEC declared that cryptocurrencies were a special case, and if you issue shares on a cryptocurrency, it is, you do not have to legally register as a public company. That would be, that's sort of the only way that this could work out and actually be able to leverage this technology for what we'd like to do. Um, if we have to register as a public company, we just can't give people shares. It's not an option. Uh, it, would, it would defeat the entire purpose of using this technology. We'd have to keep track of people's identities and stuff. There would be no cost advantage to doing it on blockchain. So we don't know exactly what the application is going to be. So it could be that we decide to do something different. Maybe we will pick a, a different, uh, I don't know, different... Uh, blockchain or something. I mean, uh, I think we'll, we'll probably will not be making our, our own blockchain, um, but we, yeah, I, don't know. I don't have the answer. Uh, we are still open to different possibilities depending on what ultimate application we decide to create. Can you talk a little bit about site chains? Sure. Um, so, can, can you finish the presentation first? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm almost done. There's not a whole lot. Um, I'll just leave this up here. Uh, let's see, I guess I talked about... Is there a link to the slides? Is there a what? A link? A link? He's, he's going to make some changes, then we'll get Yeah, I guess I'll fix the little errors, and then we can, we can make a link. Yeah, there will be a link. Um, I'll just leave the, the homework up here. These are just relevant things you guys can do if you want to master all this material. 
Um, and I would add one other thing, which is make a uh, interactive graphical script interpreter so that people can write scripts in a browser and run it and see the stack in real time. I think that would be awesome. I want to make that, and I may make it myself, but if you guys beat me to it, I think it would be really cool. It would be very educational to see something like that. Um, uh, so let me talk about side change really quickly. So I know people like Joseph are involved in Ethereum. Uh, probably a number of people have uh, involvement with Ethereum. Ethereum is really cool. Ethereum uh, uh, attempts to do go one very important step beyond Bitcoin, which is making the scripting language turn complete so that it can do anything. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm terrible at thinking of this because I don't think about what the applications are. You can Google this. There are I've got a list that I give people if they ask what the applications are. Like, basically, you can replicate the entire financial system in a decentralized way using this technology. And you can go beyond the financial system. Any type of information technology, like notaries, and anything where like identity is involved, all this stuff can be done more securely and more cheaply using, uh, I don't want to say the blockchain necessarily, but using <coughs> cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer networks. We can make a better, more secure, and cheaper uh, economy. Um, Ethereum uh, 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 is, you know, it's, 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 Similar to Bitcoin in that it's like a blockchain and uses proof of work. I think the latest thing is, I think they're going to launch using proof of work and maybe also use proof of stake or something they said. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, but the fundamental difference is that the scripting language is, is more powerful. Um, so you could conceivably do any, any type of contract that you try and do in Bitcoin. You think, I don't know how to do this because I don't have loops. You know, I, I, have no, I, I, have no, I can't make a recursive function or something. Right? You can't, but you could do that with Ethereum. Um, there is, however, a very big problem with this, which is that uh, uh, similar to how everybody has to store the blockchain, and there's this sort of distributed cost. It's like it's unsure how to pay for the fact that everybody has to store the blockchain. Ethereum has the, the same problem, as well as the problem that everybody has to run these arbitrarily complicated scripts. <laughs> so the scripts can be, you know, they could, you could, somebody could DOS the network by making a script that just, you know, maybe it's an infinite loop. And a Turing complete language has the property that you cannot know how long it's going to take to run until you run it. So you don't know if, if, if a script is necessarily ever going to finish. So I think the way they are trying to solve this now is by having an artificial limit on the number of operations that can be performed. So just like how Bitcoin limits it to 500 bytes, they have some very high limit for like, if you try to write a script that's more complicated than this, it ends and it's invalid. Um, so it's not technically properly Turing complete. I don't know if, if anybody can, I'm not an expert on Ethereum, if anybody knows anything Either it's like fuel, and you run out of fuel, your transaction, your script stops. Okay. So the way they handle it then is you have to have fuel. The ether. <laughs> That's the new guess. Okay. Yeah, you got you got to pay for each transaction, and we are going to have the I think I think we will have the college Austin Gavin here talk to you guys. But keep going. Talk, tell okay. us more. Yeah. If Vitalik is coming, don't let me talk about Ethereum. Let Vitalik. <laughs> Talk about Ethereum. Um, so just a summary in sidechains, though. Um, so the idea of sidechains is that um, it's sort of, there, there are many, many reasons to do sidechains. The idea is that it is possible to send Bitcoin to another blockchain. And it, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> the, the idea is that you can lock up Bitcoins by sending it to a complex uh, script pub key that requires a very complex script sig to spend. And the script pub key is encoded in such a way that there is another blockchain out there that can read it and know that you've now locked up those bitcoins. And the, uh, now they appear on the other blockchain. And now you can send them around and you can do other things on this other blockchain, like you can have a better scripting language. You either, maybe you copy Ethereum, maybe you do something different, maybe you don't need, maybe you just have something different than Bitcoin. Maybe you just want to add one feature, whatever it is. It's different than Bitcoin. And so now the bitcoins can live on this other sidechain and then the magic happens where you can send them back. It's very easy to like permanently lock up bitcoins by sending it to a fake address that can never be spent. It's not so easy to figure out how to retrieve them again. And the way this works is, this is the doing of Greg Maxwell, he's one of the Bitcoin core developers, figure out a way to create a concise, what he calls a, an SPV proof that the bitcoins have been locked up on the sidechain. So you send them to the sidechain, send them around or whatever, 
lock them up using a special script on the side chain, and then you create this long, not long, it's, it's, uh, it's log in the number of transactions, so it's concise. It's not, I mean, it's infinitely long, but it's logarithmic, so it's not necessarily, you know, it's, it's reasonable. You have to put that proof back on the Bitcoin blockchain to retrieve your Bitcoins. It's log in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in what number of transactions? I think it's log in like the, the, the number of transactions those Bitcoins have been spent through or something. It's either the number of transactions or the number of blocks. So it's, it's one of the two. Uh, so if you send, you know, a thousand, if you send the Bitcoins to a thousand transactions on the side chain, it's the log of that. So it would require like a hundred bytes or, you know, hundred kilobytes or whatever it is. Um, so it's something. It's either the number of transactions or the number of, of blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Pruning is uh, so. When you send bitcoins to an op return, um, everybody knows that that script pub key starts with an op return. So everybody knows that that is never going to be executed. Nobody can ever spend the bitcoins. Um, because it would immediately invalidate any transaction that somebody tried to spend it with. So you can prune it by just removing it from memory. You don't have to store the extra 40 bytes of data after the opportunity. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So you just prune it. Rather than store that data in memory, you can just delete it from memory. You do not have to store it. So, okay, here's, uh, uh, let me give you more detail. So, what? You don't, you don't remove it from the blockchain, you just remove it from your from your uh, uh, transaction output memory board. Okay. I can't I can't quite hear what you're saying, like Yeah, I think I think there are two different kinds of pruning. Right. So one is that uh, first of all, the kind of pruning I'm, I'm trying to talk about is that normally you keep the transaction outputs in memory, and if there's an opportun in your transaction output, you do not have to keep that in memory. You can immediately delete it because no one can ever spend it. That's in memory, and that's not really in the blockchain. This is more like an extra data structure that, in order to efficiently know, you know, to efficiently know if a transaction is valid, you just keep a memory pool of the outputs. You can remove op returns from that. Network. You can also, so that's pruning number one. Pruning number two is removing them from the actual blockchain. This is different. I don't know if you can really, like, you can store whatever portion of the blockchain you want. Um, there, there is a way to prune, like, old transactions or something where, like, if, if no one ever needs to retrieve them, like, there's no reason why you need to keep them around. You can just delete all spent transaction outputs, you could delete the entire transactions and you could keep running, you know, a full node without necessarily remembering the entire history of the blockchain and you can validate every new transaction because once the, once the transactions or outputs are spent, they can never be spent again and assuming they're buried under enough blocks, because hypothetically there could be a block reorg where maybe they're spent and then there's a fork or something, well, so long as they're buried under a thousand blocks or something, they're never going to be double spent. So you can just delete spent transactions. Um, so that's pruning number two, and I think I think you can actually do this in like the, the latest version of Bitcoin. It is possible to send a flag and, and delete the older uh, transactions. Um, and uh, the only catch is that uh, you might want to run a service that's healthy for the network to let other people retrieve transactions from you. If you delete them, you can't send them to other people. So it's sort of a... If you, if you prune the old transactions, you're running an almost full node, but not completely full node. You're validating it yourself, but you're also not able to send those transactions to somebody else if they want them. You know, any new person who wants to download the blockchain for the first time needs to get them from somewhere. But, but in any case, it is possible to delete the old transactions. So this memory pool is a database, right? That would be used by Bitcoin be your... Uh, yeah. And it's, you don't need physical RAM. I'm not 100% sure. I think Bitcoin Core uses physical RAM. 
Like I think it's I think it's the memory pool of the transaction outputs is in memory, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm also not an expert on this stuff, so I could be wrong about that. Not everybody necessarily stores in RAM, so I know uh, I talked to the guys at Coinbase, and they their uh, Toshi implementation also has a memory pool that's in a database that's on disk, so it's not in memory at all. So there's no reason why it has to be in memory, but it is sort of stored a second time. There's at least another index or something to keep the transaction outputs easily available. Yeah. I think it's called the memory pool because it can be a memory and that it can be optional and discarded. Um, since until it actually appears in a block, is it the client's responsibility to resubmit the transaction as necessary? Yeah, so if you want to send Bitcoins, um, uh, and let's suppose you s send a transaction with zero fee, and, and uh, I don't think I don't think I've ever done this before, but I, a friend of mine did this. Um, and you know, if you're a sophisticated person and you're deliberately trying to send a transaction without a fee, it might not get in a block. And I think there there are some rules in Bitcoin Core where they eventually remove them from memory. It also might not propagate the network. Maybe you send it to someone who just immediately signs offline or something, and like it never finds its way to a miner, and maybe you know. And then maybe the only node that has it in memory shuts off. So you might have to send the same transaction again. Um, yeah. Sorry, how do you know which, so I guess who or what determines which block a particular transaction gets submitted to from the mempool? Which block it gets, so like the miners determine what block a transaction goes in. So I see. when a new transaction comes in, They'll first check, you know, is it valid? They have to validate the transaction to know if it can go in the next block. And if it can, they put it in the next block. They have a they have a block ready, you know, that has a bunch of a list of transactions and a block header that they are making, right? So there's a single node that's responsible for there's, for doing that. There's no single node. There are many nodes. Every single miner does this, right? Well, but per block, for each block. It's yeah, I guess so. I mean, each block is produced by a miner. Okay, guys. If it's, if it's okay, we'll we'll allow you to keep talking while you walk to lunch. So, uh, I'm, so Robert is going to give a few details. Well, maybe Sri Ram's going to give a few details about the neighborhood since he's local here. But um, a big round of applause for these wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Incredible. Everybody's been telling me, "Wow, this is an amazing course." And <laughs> so. Um, um, after lunch, we'll do student introductions. We, any of you have class projects that you've been thinking about? So we'll do two, two class projects, um, one in the next few weeks, and then we'll do one in the final. And then we'll also, you know, you can do an optional project that's not necessarily a class project. Um, it could be sort of a, you know, proof of concept, some other kind of blockchain project you want to do and get some people together. So um, we'll do student introductions, we'll talk about our class projects, we'll do a little team formation in the afternoon. And we'll have an amazing time in the afternoon. Shiram, this is for lunch places in the area. Hi, folks. So uh, we are located here. That's Castro Street. If you go left across El Camino, there's a bunch of restaurants. If you go right and come down here where uh, <coughs> Cuesta, you can see that. Uh, that's like a small strip mall. They've got a Safeway, a Subway, and stuff like that out there. So. Uh, you guys can sort of, uh, you know, either find one person to go and get food for all of you, land out there and get food, either way. Is that Mediterranean barbecue open on Saturdays? One right by <laughs> Rose. Rose. Rose Market. Yeah, by the, yeah, Rose. They're, they're right by here. It's like... Uh, like two blocks. Yeah, Sonia, we I think, somewhere there. Yeah, I think that they should be open. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, they're good. They're right. Uh, you don't even have to cross El Camino for that. And there's a piece just before El Camino, so that's the local sort of area. Of course, on Castro, you got a bunch of stuff. And that Rose Market was the food from the launch party. We had that same, that's right, the Mediterranean. 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 In the future, you know, what we could do is uh, maybe just bring in some stuff from Costco or something, you know, if all of you guys want to pull in, and you can figure something out so we don't have this dislocation. Uh, we're still trying to round up uh, sponsors. Uh, we, we've got some sponsors for the demo day or the last day, but for every single Saturday, we don't yet have that. So. Oh, and have you got ideas? In terms of teams, right, there are three projects, oh, two projects and one optional. Uh, two projects are part of the course that you're required to do. 
One is, uh, which ends the first half, which is two and a half weeks, and the other <coughs> ends the second half, uh, for which you would form teams. But if those of you who have ideas that go beyond these projects that you want to explore and you want to build teams, you're uh, welcome, much as welcome, you're, you know, uh, we, we support you if you were to try to do something like that. That would be the third option on the project. Any what questions? Are the, what are the projects? I mean, what, like, what's So the ideas uh, for projects, he just gave you one idea right now, a graphic called Script Editor that's interactive, that lets you test your scripts as you go through them. That would be a great project to learn. Uh, in terms of ideas, uh, I, don't, so, I don't mean ideas, I mean just like, are we expected like to, to have like a certain magnitude or a direction to the projects that makes them different? Or so different? the first half of the project is about transactions, uh, and the second half of the project is more about distributed applications or smart contracts, so within that sort of realm. So uh, like either you build a block explorer, a uh, uh, graphic script editor, or a wallet, or some, something like that, that helps you understand transactions and scripts and addresses. And uh, you use a, uh, an API like block.io or chain.com or some higher level API, which makes it easier. It can go lower level. Depends on what you guys want to do, so you can figure something out there. For the second half, a distributed application where you use either Ethereum, Eris Industries, or, or whatever in you know, a different sort of uh, toolkit to come up with ideas about how you could do a smart contract, legal code, or just you know, a token sale of some sort. So you'd, you'd be given enough instructions to at least understand how to go about it at that stage in the game. So that's the requirement uh, for the university section. Se uh, several of that, are obviously, many of you have ideas that you'd like to explore and form teams with, which are different teams. We'd support that too. What would be, if, if somebody wanted to do their own thing, does that, the, the third one, would you demo yes. that at the demo day as well? Yes. So if you would like to do your own project and you would like to come up here and request team members or you have your own team members uh, or you want to do it through the Google group, yes. The answer is we will support that and yeah. I'll let, let them see it at the demo day. Yeah. Oh, and of course, you have the opportunity to see it on demo day. Uh, we have relationships not just with uh, industry people, but also investors who might be interested. I mean, it's all of that uh, opportunity exists. Yes. After the after lunch, we can talk about the projects that we want to bring, the teams that we want to form. Uh, after lunch. Yes. After lunch is the team formation. Yeah. After lunch. <coughs> uh, should we do it before lunch so they can <laughs> talk during lunch, or do you think you want to do it after? Yeah. Who has student projects that they? I've thought about <coughs> for for the the January one. For for the January student projects for January. Well, there's there's easily ten. Do, yeah. Why don't we so take maybe two or three? three? Just two or three now. So how about sixty seconds each? And this way during lunch, people can go and meet you up and talk to you. Come on up and come yeah. on up. Come on. I see about Introduce five people ready to come up. Come up five. Thank people. you, Ryan. <coughs> two or three. Jeff Flowers. Sunny, come on up. Okay, really quickly. Um, I'm Rich, and uh, for my project projects, I'll uh, I intend to lose some money. I like giving my money away, so I'll form money losing industries. And the first project will be an auction site that takes um, kids art that I get by donating money to donors choose, and the kids usually give me.